However, in 21st century Britain, sacred music also flourishes outside the conventional institutions and establishments of the church. Sir John Taverner was born here in suburban Wembley Park in North London at the end of the Second World War. For the last 40 years, he has written almost exclusively religious music, the majority of it for the human voice. In the 1960s, he caused a sensation when the Beatles championed his work, releasing on their Apple label, first The Whale, a biblically inspired oratorio. The Whale. Marine mammal of the order Cetacea. They comprise the Then the Celtic Requiem, a daring avant garde collage of Irish poetry, children's playground rhymes, and elements from the Requiem Mass. I like performing my music in churches because so much of my music has been inspired by the church, by church ritual, by church liturgy. But I'm often surprised by the kind of people who like it. I usually find that a considerable cross-section of the public seem to appreciate what, what, I'm, what I'm doing. Uh, a lot of people who like pop music seem to like it. But the swinging 60s took their toll, and in 1977, after a profound spiritual crisis, John embraced the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church, and its ancient traditions of icons, mysticism, and sung liturgy have dominated his life and his music. This is music which addresses God, of course, but which also evokes in its sensuality God's continuing and living presence in his creation. John, can we start with the word tradition? Because everything I've read about your music, um, the word tradition comes up, but I think you mean something quite specific. I do mean it in, in, in the broadest sense, insofar as I think the reason um, sacred music continues is because people have a thirst for tradition. They want to see some continuity. And I had to become so soaked in tradition in Orthodox tradition, I, I learned a bit about Indian music, I learned a bit about Arabic music uh, and various traditions to, to understand how they worked and, and then tried to create a style out of these various traditions. Would you, would you say now that you're essentially Orthodox or would you say yes. you're mixed? No, no, I would say I was essentially Orthodox, but open and interested in other religions. The human voice is obviously centrally important. Is that again a, a, a legacy of your faith? I think so, yes, I think so. Yeah, and also, I used to compose. My voice isn't very good nowadays, but I used to compose on my voice. What, sing at the piano? Yes, yes. Um, I always used to think, and I up to a point still, 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 still believe this, that uh, music is no good if it can't be sung by the human voice in some way. Every time we perform John's music, we have to enter almost into his soul, into his way of thinking. His music is very still. It's very difficult to sing, actually. He stretches the limits of each voice. He takes the basses incredibly low. In the top voice, is taking them very high, in a, in a very celestial. Um, everything is mirroring, basically, the world and, and heaven and, and, and hell.
that leads me on to what this music is for, who's it for? Is it for the performers themselves as an act of worship? Is it for God? I think when I compose it, I, I perhaps naively think that it's for God. Uh, I think I wouldn't be able to do it if I didn't think that. I wouldn't actually be able to go through the act of composing if I didn't think it was uh, finally for God that I was doing it. Although, probably now, sitting here on the sofa, uh, I think that's probably rather quite naive of me. Um, but then, then, then it goes, undergoes different processes and it becomes for such and such a choir. So it transforms, I think. It begins by being certain it's for God, and then as the process becomes more practical, it becomes for, for that person, which of course is an extension of God anyway. Tavener thinks about his music in a very deep way. It can be thought of as sort of music to relax to after a long, hard day's work. If it does that for some people, fantastic. But I think for most people, it's actually doing something much more. They are experiences. They are deep, deep spiritual works. We have to be part of that incredible ritual. <laughs> There's a sound world which is certainly orthodox, which you can hear in Taverner's music, but it's something that to an untrained ear is recognisable as being from that world. This repetition of the Kyrie being uh, intoned uh, 11 times in rapid succession just sounds a little bit alien to our ears, but there's a particular colour to this which is very orthodox. I just went recently to my first Greek Orthodox service, which was a friend's wedding, uh, and I was struck by how much sung music there was from the celebrants and the cantor. So much of the ceremony was actually sung rather than spoken. Ritual has always been important to me, ever since my father, when I was three, I remember, brought home um, pamphlets of cars. And, and as a three-year-old, I stamped on them uh, uh, big car, little car, big car, little car, big car, little car, big car, little car, big car, little car. And I did a ritual dance, so the importance of sacred was already important to me at three. John Taverner has been inspired too by poetry, in particular the writing of the great late 18th century mystic poet and artist William Blake. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly, bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Taverner clearly admires, even shares Blake's vision. But the lamb can seem ludicrous, mawkish, sentimental. Taverner's music reminds us of its true power. car journey from Devon to London. It was ready to finish when I got there. All in your head? Well, my, my mother was driving, so I sketched it. 
Blake always thought that his poetry was divinely dictated. I wouldn't say the music of mine is divinely dictated, but since I don't know where it comes from, it comes nearest to the description of it. As a, a six-year-old, I used to write very extreme melodic lines. So, 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 so it's something that's always been present, and I can't necessarily explain, except it is a way of providing intensity. In the mid-1990s, John's spiritual journey reached out beyond Orthodox Christianity, and he began to explore through his music ideas drawn from Islam, from Hinduism, and from Buddhism. I think the Orthodox Church points towards the East, and I was more and more drawn towards the East, and I thought there was a possibility through music to bring about some kind of unity. For instance, in Shunya, and that piece is not exactly post-Orthodox because I, I never ceased being an Orthodox, but that, that's part of a, my sort of universalist phase as a composer, um, which, which follows the Orthodox phase. I think the fascinating thing I find with John is the way he uses incredibly unusual instruments. For example, in Shunya, we had the large Tibetan bowl, an extraordinary instrument with these incredible overturns. Michael, that was absolutely mesmerising. They're beautiful, aren't they? They're Tibetan. Tibetan and Himalayan. And Himalayan. All around the whole area the of the Himalayas, Himalayas you might find these bowls. The very, very ancient. Yes. Are they still used for other They're purposes? used in rituals. These instruments can be used in a meditation. If you focus your mind on the power of the sound, you can actually uh, find a way of changing a negative thought into a positive. W would they have been used for prayer? Yes, usually to mark the beginning of a prayer. Do you want to have a go? And just let it bounce off, basically. Shunya was composed in 2004. John has said that his intention was to express a little of the inexpressible, and the Sanskrit word shunya, which means void or nothingness, is repeatedly intoned as the piece unfolds like a Buddhist ritual over the course of 20 minutes. That really was an idea to try in music rather than in silence to represent the idea of nothingness. Because it doesn't go anywhere, shouldn't you? No, no, no. To stand still. That's about the Buddhist concept really of nirvana. So I think I was always journeying towards this. I don't see any point in writing a silent piece of music, but I do see a point in the journey towards it. John Taverner evokes the religious life in all its intensity. 
His music is prayer, sometimes provoked by a particular human emotion, sometimes by the need for ritual and ceremony, but always suffused with a certainty in the presence of God. state it's not quite as big as that in his garden and he's constructed this little orthodox chapel and they hold services here so it's a working chapel he's quite an imposing man to meet and I don't know why really I mean except that I think it's something to do with the intensity of his work I think he's probably imposing anyway but certainly you're aware that he's produced this body of work that has a sort of concentrated energy and um, despite the fact that he wasn't feeling very well, um, that uh, concentration is uh, still evident. Taverner's music beautifully articulates some of our society's spiritual beliefs and feelings, but it's also a profoundly personal exploration of one individual's relationship with the mystery of the divine. And for over a thousand years, that's been the story of sacred music, a magnificent, complex human achievement built up over time from the very simplest of materials. So many people that I've talked to have reminded me that the roots of this tradition have never been forgotten. The pure, elegant line of plain chant, the mysterious, resonant drone of the lower voices, pure, uncluttered harmonies rising up to heaven and to God. Confirmation of St. Augustine's statement that those who sing pray twice. <laughs> 